In today's episode, let's talk about the graphics of the original PlayStation. What makes it look so unique that we can instantly tell if a game footage is from the original PlayStation? In fact, the unique look is a result of four flaws combined together. Each of them might be found in other systems, but the combination of all four is a unique trait of the original PlayStation. These flaws include the lack of texture filtering, the excessive use of dithering, the lack of floating point processing capability, and the lack of depth buffer. Let's start from the one that is the easiest to understand, the lack of texture filtering. Before talking about what is texture filtering, we need to first talk about texture itself. A computer 3D world consists of polygons. In the early days, 3D games or applications simply assign a color to each polygon. This means there was no texturing. This is because applying texture can be too taxing for the PCs and consoles at the time. The process of texturing is basically the process of determining what color should the screen pixel be, giving the screen space positions and texture coordinates of all the vertices of the polygon that encompasses the pixel. While screen space position is three-dimensional, telling where a vertex is located after all the transformations, texture coordinate is two-dimensional, telling where the vertex is located in the texture image. To get the color of the pixel regardless of the texturing method, the most important piece of information we must calculate is where the pixel is located in the texture image. A texture image itself consists of individual pixels, so it's intuitive to think the color of the pixel of interest should be equal to the color of the texture pixel it is located at. Though intuitive at first glance, the method will give you a rather rough texturing result because the color of a screen pixel can only be equal to the color of its belonging texture pixel. No color transition is possible, so the polygon appears pixelated when it is too big and the texture image is too small. This, however, is often the case with early 3D games due to the limited processing power of the hardware and the low color depth at the time. Modern texture filtering techniques include bilinear filtering, trilinear filtering, and isotropic filtering. They smooth out the texturing result, making the 3D view less grainy. However, as you have probably already figured out, the original PlayStation hardware doesn't support texture filtering, giving its games a rough look. But this also simplifies its hardware design. However, this flaw is found in many early platforms, including the PC when software rendering is used. It's nothing unique to the original PlayStation, so let's continue with the next flaw of the original PlayStation graphics, the excessive use of dithering. Dithering is a technique to give a smooth transition between two colors when the color palette is limited by introducing noise between two colors. So it is really a technique used when we have limited number of colors to choose from. Many PlayStation games use dithering quite heavily, but if you look at the tech specs of the original PlayStation, it supports 24-bit true color, giving us 16.7 million colors to choose from. So why PlayStation games still need dithering? The reason hides in another part of the spec. The original PlayStation has only 1 MB of video RAM. Today's video cards can easily include 8 GB or 16 GB of video RAM. This 1 MB video RAM is very small, even at the time when the original PlayStation was released. A direct result from the limited RAM size is the small amount of texture data it can store if the developer chooses to use 24-bit texture images. To be able to use more textures, most developers opt to use 24-bit textures using 15-bit color depth, enabled by PlayStation's dithering support to reduce color bending. The dithering of PlayStation looks pretty bad if we use integer scaling to display the gameplay on a modern LCD screen. But back in the days when most monitors and TVs were CRT, this wasn't that problematic. Like the lack of texture filtering, dithering isn't unique to PlayStation, but we're getting one step closer to getting an authentic PlayStation look. Now let's talk about the next ingredient, the lack of floating point capability. The interpolation step of texturing involves quite some floating point math. 
The lack of floating point capability means numbers are already truncated, hence inaccurate from the very beginning of the process. As more calculations are involved, the inaccuracy adds up. This means a slight change of the position of the vertices of a polygon might result into a big shift of the texture coordinate of a screen pixel like butterfly effect. This results into the famous or infamous texture wobbling of the original PlayStation. To add salt to injury, the original PlayStation only uses a 1-byte integer to represent each texture coordinate, giving only 256 possible values on each axis. This renders textures larger than 256 by 256 meaningless. This also means the smallest shift of texture coordinate value is 1 divided by 256, which is a pretty big value considering the accuracy of an IEEE floating point number. Adding the wobbling, we're getting even closer to an authentic PlayStation taste, but there's one more ingredient, technically more challenging to explain, but it is what makes the original PlayStation graphics truly different from other consoles and PCs of that era. That is the lack of depth buffer. The lack of depth buffer causes two visual problems in 3D rendering. It's also a headache to game developers. Typically, to render a 3D scene, the software sends vertex information and texture data to the GPU, and from there, the GPU does necessary calculation to reconstruct the 3D scene. The most important vertex information includes positions and texture coordinates. Naturally, a 3D position has three components, X, Y, and Z, representing the horizontal and vertical positions and the depth from the viewpoint. If you know how to do 3D programming, you've probably also worked with the fourth component, W. But internally, the X, Y, Z components are divided by the W component to get their real value. So in reality, there are just three components. And out of the three components, the Z component plays a very special role. This might not be obvious immediately because when the 3D scene is shown on the screen, it's basically squashed into a 2D image. So why do we need a Z or the depth component? Firstly, it plays an important role in texturing. Once the GPU gets the information of three vertices of a polygon, it must interpolate the contents of the polygon. This interpolation is called rasterization. The X, Y, and Z components and the texture coordinates of each pixel encompassed by the polygon are derived from the parameters of the three vertices of that polygon. The most essential step of the rasterization process is to know how much each vertex weighs when determining parameters of a given pixel within the polygon. And naturally, the closer the given pixel is to a vertex, more weight we should give to that vertex. Imagine a polygon with three vertices with color red, green, and blue. If a pixel is closer to the red vertex than it is to the green and blue vertices, intuitively it should look more red. Without going into too much detail, the simplest way to do such interpolation is connecting the pixel of interest to the three vertices, and the weight of a vertex is directly related to the area of the subtriangle opposing it. As you can see, the closer the pixel gets to the vertex, the bigger the subtriangle gets, so it gets more weight. This is very intuitive and gives convincing results for a lot of cases, but in reality, it is simply not correct for interpolating a 3D polygon. If we interpolate texture coordinates this way, we will get something like this. If this weird texture mapping looks something like you've seen before in a PlayStation game, you will be right. This is especially pronounced if the polygon and the viewpoint form a big angle. So how did this happen? Well, this happened because we didn't make use of the Z component when we were doing the calculation. Recall that in the perspective correct 3D view, objects get smaller when they're further away from the viewpoint. Similarly, when we do the calculation, the further a vertex gets, less weight we should give to it. Following this idea, when doing the interpolation, the weight of a vertex should be divided by its Z component. So when the Z component gets bigger, or the vertex gets further away from the camera, it gets less weight. This produces a perspectively correct image, 
but apparently that's not how the original PlayStation does the rasterization. This crucial division step is omitted from the original PlayStation's GPU. So why doesn't PlayStation interpolate in the right way? Well, because of the division. For a processor, all the instructions are not created equal. As you can see in this chart, even though addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division are all done with a single instruction for the Pentium processor, the division instruction takes hundreds of cycles to finish. This is staggeringly slow, and the PlayStation simply can't afford to do it. Some games mitigate this problem by subdividing a polygon when the camera gets closer to make the distortion less obvious or annoying. But in the end, what is incorrect will never be correct. If you are careful enough, you can always see the imperfection. However, this is not the only problem caused by the lack of depth buffer. There are also other implications. With the presence of a depth buffer, after the depth of a pixel is determined, the value is compared to what is already stored in the depth buffer for that screen location. If a previous polygon happened to encompass the same pixel location, the new pixel is only written to the final result if it's closer to the viewpoint, in which case it obscures the previous result. Without a depth buffer, this is not possible for the original PlayStation. This means a newly calculated pixel is always written to the final image. In this case, the developers must come up with some algorithm to sort all the polygons based on their depth. So the farthest polygon gets rendered first, so that other polygons can correctly obscure parts of it and construct a correct 3D scene. After going through this pain, a 3D scene might still not look correct if two polygons intersect. You see, when two polygons intersect, we can't definitively tell which one is at front. Each one has a part that is closer to the eye. Unfortunately, without per pixel depth comparison, a polygon must either be completely in front of or behind another polygon in PlayStation rendering. And this can be observed quite often in games where polygons intersect. The lack of depth buffer, excessive dithering, the lack of floating point capability, and the lack of texture filtering combined together resulting to the unique look of the original PlayStation graphics. This might sound like a lot of problems, but in the early days, PlayStation consoles were connected to a low-resolution CRT television set, so these flaws never really bother people that much. Nowadays, these flaws are more pronounced since people are emulating PlayStation games with upscaling to 1080p or even 4K resolutions but these graphical flaws have already become a staple of the original PlayStation graphics, giving more charms than troubles. So there you have it, a full breakdown of the key elements of the original PlayStation graphics. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to see more similar contents, hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Leave a comment down below if you have any questions or if you have any suggestions for future contents. I will see you in the next video.